Stephen Roy Goodman, host of Higher Education Today, a production of the University of the District of Columbia. Welcome back to the education program that connects you to contemporary issues, people, and institutions involved in the world of higher education. Today we'll be talking about student affairs professionals. Dr. Cindy Love is executive director of ACPA, formerly known as the American College Personnel Association, now College Student Educators International. She has served as executive director of both Soul Force and the Metropolitan Community Church. Cindy earned her doctorate in education from Texas Tech University. Welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. Well, we're delighted you're here. Well, maybe if we could start with what are student affairs professionals supposed to be doing on campus? <laughs> Well, the modern thought around student affairs is that we're really connecting students both in the classroom and outside the classroom to the elements that are going to bring success for them. And that those two things are, aren't disconnected. What you learn in the classroom applies to what you learn outside. What you learn outside applies inside. We run a lot of operations on campuses. That's what we're known for, housing, campus services, advising. Uh, most big universities have about 30 departments that are considered student affairs. But really the work of it now is how do you build a collaborative, interdisciplinary, connected, safe space for students to learn how to be who they want to be in the world, how to be global citizens, how to operate effectively, especially when they may have come from environments where there was only one view. Well, but what if students make a mistake? <laughs> well, we all make mistakes, so they're going to. And they're going to make uh, mistakes that are the ones that they're really going to learn from uh, in college. I mean, we know this, we've all done it, and then we moved into the workplace, and thank goodness we made the mistake there and not in the workplace, so we had the opportunity to go forward. When they make mistakes, student affairs professionals are typically the first responders. That's a lot of the work that we do. And what would be an example of kind of the main things that people would come to a student affairs professional about? You know, a hundred years ago, it was all about discipline. You uh, somehow disobeyed one of the rules on campus. You went to the dean of men or dean of women or the equivalent, and you were punished, whatever was the, uh, the punishment of the day. Now, it's really more about a learning process. Okay, you made a mistake. The mistake may be severe enough that you come under a student court or conduct uh, system, but it typically is a mistake that you've got to figure out how to get yourself out of. You know, we're not rescuing you out of your mistake, we're teaching you how to work your way through it. I, I think that's the most common. Um, we have a lot of things that, that get perceived as mistakes now on campuses that really have to do with freedom of expression and speech. Um, when you and I were in college, and I don't know how old you are, but you know, we didn't say some things to professors or other students that people have the freedom to express today. Back then it was a conduct disorder, now it's freedom of expression. What would be an example of that? Um, you know, on my campus, when I was going through my undergraduate program, you could not have used profanity uh, in a classroom with a faculty member. Now, we don't deal with that as a conduct disorder. We deal with it as a matter of civility, civil discourse, community respect. Different way of approaching the problem. Well, fair enough. In terms of today's campus, I mean, there's been a lot in the news about sexual assaults. Right. And these are not just on one or two campuses. Right. These are on many, many campuses. I assume student affairs professionals have been meeting about this and figuring out what to do. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, ACPA just formed a task force that will be dealing with this uh, from an association perspective nationwide and even outside the United States, bringing together sociologists, social anthropologists, faculty members, interventionists, everyone who has something to contribute to how do we build an environment where it's safe to report what's happened to you where there's fair disposition and fast disposition of the case and investigation, that you have a safe space to live while it's being uh, worked through, and if there are consequences, both legal and conduct and in, in related to the campus, that those are handled expeditiously. And um, we don't have that system today. We, what we have today is 
uh, when a case is reported, it's typically reported to someone who's a fir in a first responder position like a residential advisor. Uh, campus police have a protocol. Uh, most campuses have a, a system of things they're supposed to go through when this happens. But in spite of all of that, it's taking months, if not years, sometimes beyond the point of graduation of the student for the case to be resolved. The student who is, in this case, the victim, often does not feel safe on the campus and doesn't feel safe reporting. We have to work that out. Uh, it's a combination of things because the majority of rapes occur, actually 60% occur in a housing facility off campus. So, you know, the immediate perception is, well, what does that have to do with uh, a college or university? They're not in charge of that. But actually, in many cases, we run living facilities all over cities because they're not all on campuses anymore. It's a very, very complex issue. And it's not going to be resolved by creating more policy or more regulation, even though that's important. Um, that will simply cause us to react to the things that we uh, no, we have to do. What we have to do is develop community-wide, collaborative, interdisciplinary systems that address the climate, the underlying climate on campuses that makes it okay for violence to exist. But why wouldn't the government want to say, if colleges aren't going to take care of this, we're going to step in and, and do it for them? Well, they should want to, and they are. I mean, the truth is, though, the attention on this issue came out of a report in 2007. Some of the data that's being used was done in 1996, it's just been updated. We probably would have done absolutely nothing but for the fact that students started a movement and that came to the attention of the highest office in our land. We've had this before. We've lived through this at Kent State, the civil rights movement. Um, when students tell us, when it bubbles up and students say something is so fundamentally broken that we are going to speak out about it, we need to pay attention. But with all due respect, I mean, at Kent State, four kids were killed. Um, are we going to wait for kids to be killed until the student affairs community actually comes up with the protocols? Well, the student affairs community won't come up with the protocols. They will give input and advise, but those protocols will come to the student affairs group. I mean, we don't control that on campuses. But what will happen, in my opinion, is, and your example is great, at Kent State people got killed because we waited too late. What we must not do in this situation is wait too late. We have to address the fact that students, both men and women, and those who don't identify in those two ways are safe on their campuses to report violence of any type, particularly sexual violence, and we have protocols and processes in place to deal with that effectively. But the students claim that that's not the case, if I understand this correctly. Yeah, um, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, we have to create it. But how does that happen, as opposed to us talking about it? Well. You know, what we're doing at ACPA, we're an association, all right? So we're not on campuses, but we support members of our profession on campuses. We have established a task force um, because we're strong in research and scholarship at ACPA and in social justice issues. That's been our history. We have brought together a whole group of people to aggregate the research around best practices, to talk openly about the environment on their campuses, to reflect on this idea of uh, all campuses having a baseline or a survey that would be done every year around climate, and then to actually roll that up into a series of recommendations to our members, uh, institutional members, as well as to people within the federal government. Um, I think the work that's been done to date is great. It identifies we have a problem. It tells us we have to do something. It suggests to institutions that if they don't do the minimum things, survey their climate, train people as first responders to violence, ensure there's a safe space for reporting, and ensure that both victim and perceived perpetrator are treated fairly under our legal system. If we don't do those four things, then in 2016 the federal government says, well then we're just going to make you. What we know though, having lived through this already in, with the issue of civil rights around race, is that the policy and regulatory 
actions do not change culture and climate. We ought to start now, not when they tell us we have to. We ought to start now creating a culture and a climate on campuses where people feel safe. Fair enough. Well, let's talk about the creating the culture on, right. on campus. So maybe you could walk us through how is a student affairs office organized and how do they begin to structure what the climate will be for a new student? Right. Well, you'll find a lot of student affairs offices uh, up, up until very recently have not had Title IX uh, expertise specifically on their staff because Title IX was not considered the platform, regulatory platform, under which sexual assault cases would be brought forward uh, against, the, against the college and university. So suddenly you've got a lot of people who have to have a lot of expertise in Title IX. And that really hasn't been true on community colleges for the most part at all. So it's really new for them. Very large land grant institutions, private institutions, have had Title IX compliance, but not necessarily expertise. Those are a different thing. So I think you're going to see those positions added uh, to deal with that. Uh, we already have counseling services. We have you know, victim support assistance services, referral services, all of those kinds of things, police departments. What I think we're missing is all of those people need to be connected together. We, we tend to work in silos. Even within our own divisions, we often work in silos because we have expertise, we have heavy caseloads. How do we get everyone connected together so that when there is an incident on campus, you know, we don't hear that the police and the uh, rape crisis counselor actually didn't have a communication regarding that in a timely manner. Um, you know, our situation is, is really no different than any other large bureaucratic institution that any of us have dealt with. Communication is always the piece that breaks down. Making sure everyone has the information in a timely way and then responds to it is the hardest part. Well, fair enough. Maybe, you, can you walk us through Who's in the student affairs office? Oh. So is there wow. the vice president uh, and there then? Is typically a vice president of student affairs or student involvement, engagement. They used to be called uh, chiefs, but we've gone away from that language in a lot of places. So you have a senior student affairs officer. You typically have uh, housing and residential issues comprise a significant portion of, of the management of offices because you have a lot of young people housed together. Uh, typically in a lot of locations. You'll have advising, academic advising. You'll have um, sometimes counseling and development, sometimes just parts of that. You'll have identity group offices. So for example, uh, people of color, African American, Latino, LGBT, uh, women, a lot of different, we would think of identity or special interest groups. You'll have uh, student unions or student activity centers, um, food services. It's, it, it runs the gamut. I always tell people, if it's not happening inside a classroom with the door closed, it probably falls within student affairs. The exception is uh, athletics, which are typically run uh, separately on campuses. So I was at uh, Bucknell University in Susquehanna yeah. uh, this uh, past week, and I noticed at Bucknell, um, when I walked into the dining hall, there was a card for the executive chef. Ah, Does yep. that executive chef somehow report to the people in very student likely, affairs? Very likely. Very likely as part of student affairs or is under contract with a national provider. And therefore, the contract is managed by student affairs. Most big colleges use national providers. And what if a big speaker goes to a university? Uh, who, where does that fall? Depends on the area. If it's... Um, faculty colloquium, for example, that would fall typically under Vice President of Academic Affairs. If it's, um, let's talk about how to make the campus safer, that probably falls under student affairs. And that person might be a, a, a national expert on campus safety. Absolutely. And they would be brought to campus to give a talk or lead a workshop or spend a day talking to people. Absolutely. And they would be paid, presumably, to, to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and so who decides where that money is spent on whether or not there should be more money spent for 
campus safety or a, a, a women's group on campus or the Republicans or the Democrats? Right. I think that's a real challenge. Student affairs, um, a lot of people talk about student affairs investments on the part of campuses being on the increase since basically the 60s um, when we had a lot of changes due to student activism on campuses. Um, the truth is they have been on the increase, but they're still only about four to six percent of the operating budget of a college. So the prioritization of what gets presented on campus is going to be heavily loaded toward uh, academic affairs rather than student affairs. And student affairs are probably more often in the position of lobbying for additional investment rather than automatic allocations. Um, they're also more likely to be restructured all the time. So you'll see different reporting structures happening because there's very little restructuring of faculty due to tenure. So, you know, there's no simple answer, but the reality is the decision making around that is probably a joint process between the uh, Office of Academic Affairs and the Office of Student Affairs. Is that the case overseas as well? Uh, that's a different very different situation. It differs from country to country and student affairs as a discipline has not been well developed in most most of the world. Um, some exceptions in Europe, like we're working right now with a group in China that are really trying to launch student affairs in China. We're doing the same thing in the Caribbean. So let's say I was interested in getting involved in student affairs and I was a student, college student what would you advise that I study to prepare for a career in student affairs? Well, there are, of course, uh, graduate programs in student affairs all around the country. From an undergraduate perspective, we get a lot of people coming into student affairs who have a heart sort of for advocacy or for students, and, but they come out of every discipline. We really haven't found that, that you'll do better in student affairs necessarily because you majored in a particular area. You need a a broad, solid liberal arts education. You need to be a great communicator, so you would do very well. Uh, you, you need to be able to stay cool in tough situations. It's really more an inner reflection on who you are than it is the academic program until you get to the graduate level. When you get there, we have a set of agreed upon professional competencies for entry level, first through fourth year, mid-level, and then senior level officials. And I always tell people, if you read the list of competencies, um, you know, you would think you'd have to be the president of the United States to try and be a student affairs person, because they're really complicated. And you can understand why, because they deal with very, very complex issues on campus that are not easy to unravel. Well, but let's get to the issue of some of those complex situations. Okay. Yeah. Um, I had a call the other day from a, a dad who I'm working with who was frustrated about, a stu about the housing at a particular college right. and asked my advice about it. Right. Well, here was an interesting dilemma, right? On one hand, um, I want to encourage students and families to be happy where they are. Right. On the other hand, uh, does it make sense for parents to be involved in housing issues for their kids on different campuses? And if so, how much should they be involved? Well, let's go to the point, does it make sense? Let's start there. Um, you know, for quite some time in, in education up until the last couple of decades, we operated under something called in loco parentis. When you came to college, we became your substitute parent. And so uh, there was very little interaction with parents once you left home. Under the Privacy Act in recent years, you know, once a student is of majority age, you can't contact anybody about them or share information unless they're at risk of uh, harming themselves or others. So you've got this issue now that we don't operate under in loco parentis anymore, so we have a lot more parental engagement and involvement on campuses than we had in the period uh, from the 40s until up until about the mid-90s. It's created some interesting scenarios. Parents don't like the housing that their student is in or maybe even worse, they, their student feels threatened. They want to get involved directly with the college in negotiating the change. Let's say the student isn't a minor, which in many cases they're not because 
46% of all students entering college now are entering community college level and the average age is 25. So you're the student affairs person dealing with housing. You talk to the parent, you talk to the student, you talk to both. Well, the first thing you do, obviously, is ask the student, what do you want? Again, we're, we're trying to get this student into the adult mode of decision making and make the kind of cognitive behavioral shifts they need to make. We also know that adolescence as a stage is advancing throughout our whole culture. Uh, people who used to marry at the age of 21 are waiting until they're 30. People who used to move out of their parents' homes as soon as they could possibly find a place are now staying until they're 28. How does that play into it? You know, the first thing you've got to come back to every time is, what's the point here? The point is to try and make the student successful. So, first thing is, what do you want? Do you want to engage your parents in this discussion? They want to be engaged. Then you get everybody in the same room, if you're lucky, and you begin the conversation around, okay, what are the basic needs that we're trying to meet? What are the problems that we see? How can we come to a joint resolution? So much of student affairs is about careful listening, intentional thought, reflection, trying to get people to think before they act. But should, speaking about thinking and acting, should the student affairs person take the call of the parent? It depends. If, it, if the issue involves something that's a violation of the Privacy Act, they'll have to tell them. They'll have to, to get a waiver for that to happen. Um, sometimes it's hard to discern on the front end, but you know, I always tell people, unless someone is screaming or dying or it's 911, the best thing to do is get the information, pause, consult with your colleague or whoever you have to on campus, and then go on with the call. And I think the same thing applies in any good business. Well, and, and the pause, if we can get to the issue of FERPA, right. you raised that a moment ago. There have been some critics, and I have to admit that I've been one of those critics, right. who have said that universities have spent a little too much energy hiding behind FERPA. Right. What do you think about that? Well, there are certain latitudes in interpreting FERPA in, in your campus climate, and I think what you see is the personality of the campus, the culture and climate of the campus historically will determine how much latitude they take with FERPA. Um, a lot of these things we think, oh, they apply across the board to the campus. Well, they don't. A campus that's 100 years old as opposed to a campus that's 400 years old as opposed to a campus that's 20 years old have a very different take on what their culture and climate looks like. I find that um, people's willingness to express that kind of latitude has a lot more to do with climate for the students overall on the campus. If there's a lot of open discourse, uh, if the tone is civil, you're more likely to have greater latitude under FERPA. If it is more sort of top-down restrictive, command, control, um, then you're going to find a lot more non-disclosing behavior. Well, and this non-disclosing behavior has affected a number of campuses, particularly in the yes. athletic arena. Yes. Um, I mean, you don't have to be a, a genius to figure out what's going on at the University of North Carolina to right. see that uh, the people at UNC don't want to talk about what happened with certain student athletes. Right. Or, or certain student athlete supervisors. I mean. This issue applies not just to students, it applies to employees as well. And I think, um, I think the incredible thing would be if we could look out 10 years from now and say, you know, when something bad happens to someone, whether it's a student or employee, our first response is not to figure out how we can keep the media from finding out or how we can keep students from twittering about it or how we can keep uh, from getting sued. Those are the sort of the three knee-jerk responses, I think, of most of us in all the environments we're working in right now because we have a litigious society and we're scared to death of something going viral. So, you know, to me, if we could look out 10 years and say, actually, our first consideration is, you know, do no harm, 
harm reduction, and do we really need to change something here? Because I don't think it's that we don't know when something's wrong. I think we do know. I think we don't know how to deal with it. And so we hesitate, sometimes we hide, sometimes we, um, I hope we don't, but sometimes I think we create alternative distracting scenarios. I tell people in student affairs that when I meet them now, I say, look, you're going to be a walking systemic intervention. And that came from Dr. Steve Sprinkle on the TCU campus. But you, you are the one person who typically impacts more people on the campus than anybody. You're going to touch them in registration, admissions, in student services, in the student union, in housing, and residence. If you influence every employee in your division to deal authentically, transparently, and accountably in every situation you come into, you will change the culture on a campus. And that's a tall order. I get it. Um, but I think as a parent, that's what I would expect. As a student, it's what I would expect. And I hope as a government, it's what I would expect. Well, fair enough. On that note, Dr. Love, thank you so much thank for coming you. on the show. Thank you. If you would like additional information about Dr. Cindy Love, please visit myacpa.org. If you have comments or suggestions about higher education today, please send an email to our viewer mailbox at highereducationtoday at topcolleges.com. Thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. Please join me again for another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today.